We have a very exciting festival for you today. We're going to have African drums. We're going to have uh, Japanese taiko. We're going to have Asian Indian uh, tabla drum and the sacred hoop dance of the Navajo. Thank you so much for sponsoring our festivals, Nicholas and Delman. To complete your enjoyment of our festival, make sure you go to the website, to the Bowers website, and download the art projects and the recipe. Robin Zucadia is going to perform on the tabla drums. Wait until you hear him. He's a master. Hi, my name is Robin Zucadia, and I'm really thrilled to be back here at the Bowers Museum and part of the virtual uh, festival focused on drumming. Uh, the drums that you see in front of you here are called the tabla, and I'm going to play for you first. And uh, happy to share more about the history and the context of these drums with you as well. Tatrak dinda, da dina, dati, dati, da da dina, tagagaran, da dina, dati, da kadati, da da tina. Kita tak tun, tun na kita tak tun, tun truk tun, truk truk tun. Kena tagaran da dina, karan da dina, karan da dina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for listening to that. And I hope uh, you enjoyed that and got to 
see the connection between what I'm playing and what I'm saying. Uh, the most important thing about tabla is that it comes from a language. And the language is something you learn first before you even learn to touch and play the drum. When I first started studying this beautiful instrument uh, with my guru, Pandit Swapan Chaudhary, uh, I began just by speaking. You speak the, the syllables that connect to the drum. For example, na na tun, na na tete. Ge ge da, ge ge din. So over time, you learn to actually play the instrument after speaking it. And that's one of the most beautiful things about the, the, the language of tabla. And the drum itself is a reflection of centuries of culture in, this, in South Asia, which comprises present-day India, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and all of the countries that are in that part of the world right now. Uh, but of course, centuries ago, there were no boundaries between these countries, and it was a much more fluid and much more open culture uh, in terms of the exchange of ideas. So the Persian uh, invasions that happened between the 1200s all the way up until the 1500s, and then uh, onward ended in 1857 when the British finally came to India and conquered New Delhi. That period of time is where this instrument really evolved. And tabla itself uh, is, is a reflection of many, many different kinds of drumming traditions. So you have, number one, the language, which I just shared with you. That language is a reflection of, of much older drums that, that don't even look like what tabla look like today. Uh, many, many centuries ago, the drum was actually connected with a single piece of wood. And over time, uh, as the, the musical tastes of people evolved and also the needs for people to be able to travel with instruments and play in different contexts evolved, the drum was broken in two and became what we see as tabla today. In fact, older tabla were much larger. In fact, I have a drum here. This is also tabla, but if you listen to it, it's lower, it's richer, and it's a little bit bigger. Some of the older tabla were much taller because they didn't have microphones back then to project the sound. So this instrument continues to evolve uh, as audiences evolve and as we uh, play the instrument with different kinds of traditions. And so tabla is, is a constantly changing and evolving instrument, and it's bringing in lots of different cultural influences from South Asia and beyond. Uh, so that's one of the most important things about tabla is the language. And then, of course, the architecture, uh, the actual rhythm itself. So, for example, what you heard me play just now is something, uh, are a number of compositions, they're poems, uh, that I learned from my teacher. And those poems are put into a context of 16 beats. 16 beats. Da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, da. This is like a canvas, like when you're painting, uh, you need a canvas that has a frame around it and you paint within the canvas. 16 beats is a canvas of time. And within that canvas of time, we can improvise and we can create different rhythmic poems. Uh, so that's what I played for you today was in the cycle of 16. Uh, tabla is such a versatile instrument. Um, nowadays, you're gonna hear this instrument in hip hop, you're gonna hear it in flamenco music, you're gonna hear it uh, even in rock and roll. Um, there's something so beautiful about the language of tabla that it fits across many, many different cultures and many, many different kinds of music. Uh, in fact, many, many Western percussionists are now studying tabla because it gives you that language. It gives you that ability to translate rhythm into a, a very efficient and beautiful uh, spoken approach to making music. And uh, because of that, tabla has a lot of relevance across different cultures. But even looking at the drum, if you think about what connects this to, let's say, African drums or uh, Middle Eastern percussion, 
uh, or Western drums, is that you have this idea of a, fr uh, of a body with a, f with a skin membrane on top. And that membrane is, is affixed to the frame and stuck together through these straps. Um, every single drumming tradition out there across cultures has some concept of, of connecting the skin to a body. Now, that is a, a major unifier across all drumming traditions, and you're gonna learn that over the festival as you see all these different drums. But what makes tabla unique is there's no hole at the bottom. This is a, a, an enclosed chamber of air. This skin on top is, is made of goat skin, and then you have uh, cow skin that makes the braiding, and then you have camel skin that make the straps. So three different animals have given their skins to make this instrument possible. Uh, this strap is actually like shoelace. It's one continuous piece of strap, and you can see how it's all wrapped together at the bottom. So these are drums that are, that are handmade uh, in India, uh, and they are, um, they've been handed down for generations of drum makers from, from the, 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 the fathers to the sons in a long tradition of handmade instruments. And so a lot of the drums you're gonna see today are also handmade. And there's something very beautiful about the, 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 the manufacturing of tabla. It doesn't just come from a factory, it comes from human hands. So one of the most important distinguishing factors of tabla from other drums is this beautiful black spot that you see in the middle of all the drums here. What is this black spot and why is it so important? Well, it's made of metal. It actually is, uh, uh, small iron filings crushed to powder and mixed with rice paste and, and glue and then it's put on by hand onto the tabla and it creates the sound that we hear. See how it resonates? When I tap the drum it keeps, keeps going. But if I, if I tap it and then I touch it, Wherever my finger hits the black spot, it dampens that sound, and that's what creates all the different sounds that you hear in tabla. And then on the, on the, the, the baya, this is the, the bass drum, you have this. Tabla is one of the few instruments that has a melodic side to it too. It doesn't just make one single note. You can modulate the bass. And so the bass drum also has a black spot. And that black spot, just like the one on the, the tabla drum, <coughs> is made of metal uh, iron filings. And so it also resonates. See that? So this is what really makes tabla unique and is also so beautiful in terms of the way you can shape sound. Uh, I don't even think tabla is a drum, actually. I look at it, at it more as like an instrument. It's a, it has all the capabilities of creating expressive, melodic ideas. Why do I play tabla? Uh, I, I play tabla because every time I sit with the drum, I get this amazing feeling uh, of connection to South Asia. Um, my family is from South Asia, but I was not born there. Uh, I grew up most of my life uh, in the United States, and I didn't get to really go to India for the first time until I was 21 years old on a, on a college study abroad experience. And, you know, I grew up learning about my roots. My parents would tell me things about India, uh, but I, it had no real physical connection to me uh, until I went there and I finally got to see where my parents had come from and I got to meet my family, and I got to taste the food and, and really be in the culture. And it was on that trip that I took a tabla lesson. And something just instantly clicked for me. It was almost like I was being transported uh, back in time and then also into the future, and I realized that this is the instrument that I really wanted to study and focus on. Up until then, I studied all kinds of Western music, including jazz. I played alto saxophone uh, in marching band, and concert band all through high school, but I didn't study drums, I didn't study tabla, 
I didn't even really know what tableau was. And then when I saw the drum, I was like, how hard could this possibly be? I mean, they look like small little drums. I mean, how difficult an instrument could this possibly be? Again, I was very naive because once I started playing the instrument, I realized there was a language you had to learn. I had to li literally learn how to speak again. Uh, and then I realized how beautiful that language was. Uh, and for anyone who hears tabla, whether your background is, in, is from South Asia or not, it's mesmerizing. It has such a beautiful quality to it. And the, the, it connects you to nature. It's a very introspective and very ancient and deep uh, sound. It's the kind of thing that really, um, I think, makes you feel like you're a part of a larger aspect of humanity. And so I hope that by listening to tabla today, you too feel inspired to learn more about this beautiful instrument and the, and the culture in which it comes from. I'll end with uh, a groove. You know, what's beautiful about tabla is it has a very uh, academic almost, very intense uh, formal solo tradition. But tabla is also great because it has a lot of groove and it can really make you move. And so I want you to hear tabla in that context as well. showed you here so far is uh, rhythms in 16 and 8 and 4. You know, these are, these are just straightforward uh, grooves that all of us can feel. Dagen na thin na ka din na, dagen na thin na ka din na, dagen na thin na ka din na, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But there's a lot of different cycles of time, including 10, for example. So I'll just play a little bit for you in 10 and just, I want you to feel how different that sounds. So you, you, you heard this drum, which is in C-sharp. Let me play something for you in this drum, which is tuned to G. Uh, and that's another important, uh, important part of tabla, is the fact that you have to tune the drums. I always carry my trusty hammer here, and the hammer is how we keep the drums in tune. Just like you tune a violin or any other instrument, you have to very carefully adjust to make sure that, that the, the tightness of this head stays balanced across the drum. So while this drum is in C sharp, this one is in G. So you can see how nice and how different and how low that sounds. So let me play for you on that one.
This is, act, this is a, a, one of my favorite compositions that, again, I learned from my, my teacher, Pandit Swapan Chaudhary. It goes like this. Da, 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 gege, naga, dinna, dinna, gene. Tete, gege, naga, dinna, naga, dinna, dinna, gene. Kire, taka, tere, kite, naga, dinna, dinna, gene. Dara, gege, naga, dinna, naga, dinna, dinna, gene. Da, da, da. Red Boy Productions. They have a beautiful sacred hoop dance to show you. Hello, we are Red Boy Productions and we are a Native American dance troupe locally here in Orange County. We're excited to be here at the Bowers Museum. We're made up of different uh, individuals that are from various different tribes and I'll start with uh, Jorge Lechuga, uh, Navajo Mexican American. Bach Garcia, Tona Otham. Nanaba Kedenihi, Navajo. Lupi Lopez, Otomi Yaki. Um, music that we sing has been part, it's part of our culture. And as a singer, I've been singing probably 30 plus years. And uh, Bach actually uh, learned a little from me as well. And he's been singing since he was probably like three or four years old. Uh, this is something that um, Native people grow up with. Uh, particularly here in the urban area, it's a little harder to learn our culture, but there's a lot of people who are willing to share the culture and myself, I've learned from my elders and I'm passing it on to uh, the next generation. So part of this is just a way of life. makes me feel very happy and content inside um, just knowing I'm dancing for all of my ancestors and elders and those who can't dance um, just makes me happy inside. 
I first learned to do the hoop dance when I was 10 years old, and I'm 19 years old now, so I've been doing this for nine years. Um, I usually compete and showcase my uh, cultural dance at a competition for the hoop dance. It's called the Museum World Championship Hoop Dance Competition. And um, February 2019, I took the world champion title for a world uh, teen hoop dancer.
the next performance by Makoto Taiko. Taste of Taiko from Hunter Lloyd, artistic director and lead instructor of Makoto Taiko. He just performed a segment of Sakura Fubuki, one of his original compositions. I'm Kristen Hayashi, a longtime member and board member of Makoto Taiko, and we're coming to you from our studio in Pasadena, California. Taiko means big drum. It refers to the sacred instrument as well as the cultural art form, both of which originated in Japan. So I will briefly share the origins of Taiko introduction and development of the United States, as well as the roots of our group, Makoto Taiko. Hunter will introduce the various types of drums that we play and the differing sounds that they make. And finally, we'll share a little bit about what Taiko means to us and leave you with a short clip of one of our performances. Taiko has been played for centuries in Japan for a variety of reasons, including folk dancing that takes place at Obon, an annual summer festival that honors ancestors in celebration of rich harvests, as part of Buddhist and Shinto ceremonies, in times of war to um, encourage warriors, and also in traditional cultural performances such as kabuki. And while taiko is still incorporated into religious ceremonies as well as the music that accompanies folk dancing, it has evolved into a very popular cultural art form. Taiko has been part of Japanese culture for hundreds of years, yet kumi daiko, which is the performance of taiko as a group, or ensemble started just within the last 70 years or so in Japan, so in about the 1950s. And by the 1960s, Seiji Tanaka, who was originally from Japan, introduced Kumi Daiko to the United States. He started San Francisco Taiko, which was the first group in the U.S., and shortly after, in the early 1970s, San Jose Taiko began, and um, Kinata Taiko out of Los Angeles. This was a time in the United States when social movements, including civil rights, anti-war, women's and ethnic studies movements were really shaking up society and causing people to question the status quo. Japanese Americans and other Asian Americans became inspired to seek out connections to their cultural heritage as well as embrace and express their ethnic identity. Taiko became an empowering way to do this, partly because it's loud, it's dynamic and powerful. Today, there are Taiko groups all over the world. It's estimated that there are a thousand groups in the United States and Canada alone. And Southern California likely has the largest concentration of professional community and collegiate groups. Makoto Taiko is one of these groups. Um, Makoto Taiko started in 1999 in Pasadena, which is two members, Stephen Tokunaga and Robert Mercado. It has since grown to over 80 members, ranging in ages from five to 80. We're a very diverse group with more women than men, representing a wide spectrum of ethnic backgrounds and musical experience. Makoto Taiko is comprised of a community performing group, as well as students, both youth and adults, who take weekly classes. So Makoto means pure drum sound. It's a play on words. So the kanji or Chinese characters um, represent ma, ko, to, or oto. Makoto also means sincerity or truth, and it's a value that we aspire to as we play Taiko. Koji Nakamura, one of our lead senseis or instructors, always instills in us the importance of playing with a pure heart, which he defines as being humble, joyful, and playing together as one. Playing with Makoto means that when you put energy into the drum, you receive energy from the drum back. So let's talk about some of the different kinds of drums, Hunter. Hi, I'm Hunter, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about the different types of taiko that we have. First, we have the odaiko, it means big, fat drum. You've got a big, nice, deep sound. This is made from one body of a tree. And from that one tree trunk, we have the odaiko. 
And if we go smaller, we can create a little bit smaller drum. We go to the Chu Daiku, the medium sized drum. It's also not as deep as the Daiku, but this is the staple of most Taiko groups. This one is also a solid tree trunk, from a solid tree trunk body. Also, it may be difficult for most groups to have all solid tree trunk bodies uh, uh, for a taiko, for two daikos, but this one is made from a wine barrel. Same kind of sound, but not as expensive. bass and I also play a certain piece you can have different melodies and more, more faster pace because it can drive it can it can play and kind of pierce through all the other drums that are played. Literally is a barrel drum made from a from bamboo to make a sorry bamboo stage to create the okedo. So I'm going to be playing on a katsugi okedo, which literally means to carry over your shoulder or your back. This is a katsugi okedo. one of our pieces samurai pieces. Touch the audience because they're playing with a pure heart rather than 
playing with uh, another intention of, to show off or to just to entertain. You know? I agree with you. I've been playing about half the time you have been playing, and I'm nowhere near half as good as you are. But I have to say, you know, I'm not musically inclined at all. But I love that through Taiko, I can be creative and I can make music. Um, and I also really appreciate the athleticism and the choreography and just the energy that's so integral to Taiko. So I think that's what makes Taiko just such an amazing art form. Um, and you're right, and, and it's something that just really anyone can play without musical experience. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess we'll just wrap it up and say that if you like what you've heard and you'd like to join us for virtual classes, check out our website, makototaiko.org, and you can learn more about um, how you can play with us. Thanks. See you there. Thank <laughs> you. African drums and dance are next, and it's a very exciting performance. Get ready. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Dafra West African Dance and Drum Ensemble, and we're here uh, during this uh, COVID time uh, to take you on a trip to West Africa, a cultural trip, and uh, I hope uh, <coughs> you will be enjoying this trip with us while keeping safe distance. Uh, we don't have that uh, safe, safe distancing, but uh, yeah, we've been together for like uh, the past uh, couple of weeks. Dafra. <laughs> Oh, 
We have master balafon player, jeme player, and dunu player, solo solo from uh, Ivory Coast. And he is playing this amazing instrument uh, called uh, the balafon. And uh, this style is uh, from uh, the Soso people from uh, West Africa. Uh, the balafon is believed to be the ancestor of the piano. It has uh, 21 keys, and under uh, the wood, they get uh, the resonance from uh, little calabashes. So solo on the balafon. Master Griot Abubakar Kuyate, who is uh, who is from Guinea, and uh, Abubakar is from the Griot family uh, of West Africa. The Griots are uh, the keeper of uh, our tradition back home. Uh, our tradition is not written, but it's sung, so it uh, it's being passed uh, through generations uh, that way. And Abubakar is uh, one of these people that he that has a. Uh, uh, the charge of keeping it alive by uh, singing it to everybody. And here, he will be playing uh, this amazing instrument called the Kora. It's spelled K-O-R-A. And uh, it's made with a calabash, uh, the wooden bridge, and uh, 21 strings. Uh, some people say that uh, the Kora is uh, an ancestor of the harp. Uh, it's, uh, it's still to verify, I, I don't know it's, uh, if it's true or not, but uh, I just throw it there. Uh, for sure, the sound is uh, pretty similar. And uh, Abu will be demonstrating something on the Kora. Thank you. 
Okay, then uh, here we have uh, a set of uh, three drums called uh, dunduns. And uh, the dunduns are uh, the foundation of uh, uh, the music that we are playing right now. Uh, they keep the rhythm, they tell us what rhythm we are playing. And then uh, the djembe, balafon, and kora are playing the accompaniment and embellishing everything. And uh, on the set, each instrument has uh, his uh, own name and his own significance in, uh, in the culture. Normally, you are supposed to have one drummer on each instrument. But uh, with globalization and uh, uh, all kind of uh, uh, improvement uh, in uh, life and uh, because of uh, uh, practice, uh, uh, how do you say, Practi practicability, like, uh, yeah, uh, for uh, artists to be able to uh, travel uh, overseas, you often need to have one person playing on the three instruments. And that's what uh, Solo is doing today. So on the set, the smallest one is called Kenkeni, Kenkeni. And the Kenkeni is believed to be like uh, a child who is in the world and uh, still looking uh, uh, for his pathway in life. The medium one is called no, on the edge, Sangba. And the Sangba is like uh, a young adult who kind of knows what they want in their life, but uh, they, they are still making a couple mistakes. So they, are, uh, they need to be grounded, but they already know what they want. And the medium one, who is the mother drum, is called Dundumba. And the Dundumba is the voice of the elders. It's here to provide uh, 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 counseling when uh, someone gets uh, 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 out of the way. Or it's here to embellish the music when uh, you play uh, with three drummers separately. And Solo will be demonstrating something on the Dundum. So what he did was uh, to start with uh, the part of the Kenkeni, then later he was playing Kenkeni and Sangban today together, and then at the end he added the Dundumba to bring the real melody, played by three people. Yeah. And then the last instrument will be the djembe, uh, introduced by the, uh, uh, demonstrated by uh, master drummer Abu Bakar Kuwaiti again. So the djembe is one of the most popular instruments in the world, actually. Uh, and, and I think it's a kind of tying, uh, or more, it's a little bit more than the guitar. And uh, it's made out of a wood, uh, wood uh, trunk. It's coming from a tree. It's not coming from Home Depot. <laughs> so they carve it. The inside is empty so that uh, the sound can travel. Uh, on the top, you have uh, uh, often uh, a goat skin, but some people uh, prefer to have cow skin, so you can use a goat or a cow. And no matter how fast the drummer is playing, you need to know that he's using only three different sounds. The first one is called the uh, tone. Second one is the slap. And the last one is the bass. So bass, tone, slap. Bass tone slap, and now uh, Abu will demonstrate what he can do with uh, the three sounds.
you, Abu. Uh, Jansa is a celebration dance from uh, West Africa. Uh, 
we usually play it when uh, we have any kind of any type of uh, joyful celebration including uh, harvesting and the uh, step that we'll be learning today is a step that you do in the fields when you are harvesting uh, the, uh, how do you call that? the crop right yep. so we'll start uh, with no music first we're starting with feet parallel and imagine that you are picking something from the floor going to your left and putting it in the basket on top of your head so you will have this motion with your wrist putting uh, uh, the crop in uh, the basket then pick and then basket to the right and then pick basket pick basket with a big smile let's try it uh, four times and the motion of putting the crop in the basket is your uh, one in the feet in the counts so we'll do five six seven pick one two five seven one more time one three five seven good and now since it's a dance we will have to, we will need to embellish it by involving the hips every time you're putting the crop in the basket just put your hips out so you will have this motion and the easiest way to do it is to tuck your knee in and just release the hips out don't go up don't go down but it's staying horizontal like here 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 let's try five six seven eight and one and three and five seven eight one three and five six seven stop let's try it with the music
festival is complete without our art projects and of course what would it be this month but drums so we have a Chinese hand drum and a coffee can drum hello today we're making a rattle drum so this instrument is played by twisting the handle back and forth to have the pellets hit the middle of the drum so for this instrument, you are going to need two sturdy plates, a dowel for the handle, some yarn and beads, a hole punch, scissors, and then a pencil and markers for decorating, a stapler and a glue gun. So let's get started. First, we're gonna start with hole punching the plates. 
So you're gonna choose two plates of the same size and you're going to hole punch one plate right across from the other side. And then you're going to put it on top of the opposite plate, the other plate. You're gonna use a pencil to mark. And then you're gonna hole punch the other plate as well. Now we're going to hot glue the stick to the plates. So you want a stick that's long enough to cover the, the plate and also long enough to handle. And you also want to hot glue the stick so that it is perpendicular to the holes on the plate. And be careful not to burn your fingers. Make sure that the holes line up. So now we're going to staple the sides together. So you can use hot glue gun, but the gap is a bit too wide. So I'm going to use the stapler instead. Now we're going to add the yarn and the beads to the drum. So the length of the yarn depends on the size of your plate. So you want it to reach the middle of the drum from the hole. So it needs to be double, doubled up from the hole to the middle. And that's how long. And then you need two of them for each side. And then for the beads, you can have one to two beads per side. So thread the yarn through the beads. I'm going to do one bead per side. And I'm using a paper clip to help me get the yarn through the bead. And then you're going to tie a knot. So then we're going to add it to the drum. You're gonna put one side through and then the bead side and then just pull. And then same thing on the other side. There we go. And then you can try it out. And then if it's not long enough, you can just try again with the yarn. So now that you've finished your drum, now you can decorate it. So you can either decorate one side or both sides of the drum. Uh, and you can do this using like the zodiac animal that you were born in. You can do the this year's zodiac animal, which is the year of the rat. Uh, you have your choice to really decorate however you want it to. Uh, so always try to do it in pencil first, very lightly. So I'm going to do some lanterns on this one.
So here is the finished Chinese rattle drum. Thank you so much to the Nicholas Endowment for sponsoring our festivals. Hello, today we're making a drum can. So for this art project, you're going to be making a drum, um, really using something that you can find at home. Uh, so you're gonna need to find a can, so that's gonna be the body of the drum. And then you're gonna need something to be the membrane, so the top of the drum. So originally drums are made um, usually out of wood or metal. And then the membrane is usually done with the skin of an animal, like a cow or a goat. Uh, so if you have a can that already comes with a lid, then you are pretty much done. If you don't have one, then you can make the membrane using either tape or a balloon and a rubber band. So this is mostly for smaller cans. So for this art project, you'll need some cans. So either balloon and a rubber band, tape. Then you need your drumstick. So I have this one, which is a one half of a chopstick, a pencil, and then markers or construction paper to decorate your drum. So let's get started. So first, you're gonna need to take off the labels from the can so that we have a clean workspace. So however you can, peel off the label. And next we're going to decorate it. So if you have paint, you can paint them. You can also use Sharpie, just like our sample over here. So this one was decorated using Sharpie. Uh, or you can use uh, construction paper. So I'm going to use construction paper. So I'm going to use construction paper to decorate this drum. So I'm gonna start with the black. And you're going to use the pencil and the can to measure out the size and the length. And I'm gonna glue it to the can. Be very generous with the glue. Count to ten. Okay. So then I'm going to use the other construction pieces to decorate. Now that our drums have been decorated, now we can cover up the openings with the membrane. So if you have a bigger drum, you can use the tape. And if you have a smaller can, you can use the balloon. So I'm gonna start with the smaller one. So first you're gonna stretch out the balloon. 
and then you're gonna cut right where it opens up for the bottom. So stretch it out a bit again. And then we're gonna cover up the opening It might take a few turns to stretch it. And then you just go along the sides and pull so that you have a stretched top. And then the rubber band is just to keep the balloon in place. So again, be careful with the rubber band. So make sure that the balloon is stretched tight. But be careful not to rip the balloon either. So now let's try it with our chopstick drumstick. All right, not bad. So now let's try the bigger drum with the tape. So for the bigger drums, you're gonna cover the opening with tape. So you have to make sure that it is stretched tight. And that there's no holes anywhere. You can try playing it with just one layer of tape. Just make sure that there's no air holes anywhere. All right, not bad. So I'm gonna do another layer going the opposite way. Okay, now let's try with the two layers of tape. it. So there we have two different sizes of drums with two different membranes on top. So I hope you have fun making your own drums at home. Our recipe for this month is Navajo fry bread. Navajo fry bread is the same ingredients that go into a flour tortilla, but they're fried. The dough is fried instead of put on the griddle. And depending on what you put on it, it can be a fry bread, it can be a sopapilla from New Mexico, or it can be a bunuelo from Mexico. Thank you so much for sponsoring our festivals, Nicholas Endowment.